Well, good morning to all of you. Morning. Don't you all have a life? Shouldn't you be at the mountains or at the beach this weekend? Y'all, y'all need to get a life, y'all. Come on, live it up a little bit. Now I'm teasing with you all. Good morning. It's good to see you all as we gather here to worship Jesus. Uh, just let me share with you one very quick announcement. Uh, this coming Wednesday, September 8th, uh, Wednesday night at 6.30, we'll have a new membership class uh, up here in the Education Wing in the GOCC Cafe. If you are interested in membership in Growing Oaks uh, in our church constitution, uh, you do have to go through a membership class. And so if you have not gone through that and you want to join our church, I want to encourage you to come. Uh, there is no obligation to join the church if you come. Uh, you can simply come and explore if this is the church uh, for your membership and if you want to be a part of it. Uh, so it'll be this Wednesday, uh, 6.30, uh, September 8th. If you have got your Bibles, uh, head on over into the Old Testament. Have not been over there in a long time. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, we have spent a lot of time in the New Testament going through the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, but this morning we will be in 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings 22. Let us pray. God, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house and to worship and to celebrate the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you for your holy word. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that your word is timeless, uh, that your word is true. And that, Lord Jesus, we are called to be faithful to your word. And I pray that we as a church, that we as your people, O oh God, would stand and build our lives on the truth of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On February 12, 1974, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was arrested by the KGB and charged with treason. Here was a man who had won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, but after his arrest in 1974, would spend the next eight years of his life in a Russian gulag. Why? Because he was one of those very rare people who mustered the moral courage to stand against what was wrong and to stand up for what is right. He refused to bow to the propaganda of his government. He refused to compromise to the intimidation tactics that were being used against him and his family. So on the eve of his excommunication, he published one final plea to the Russian people. And the title of it is an all-timer. Live not by lies. And here we are in 2021. Because daily we are being pounded by, by lies and propaganda and false narratives and intimidation from our culture, the news media, and yes, even our own government. My challenge for all of you, church, is live not by lies. It is time for Christians to stop giving lip service and it is time for us to stand up and to speak up and to live our lives under biblical conviction. My friends, it is time for us to look and see the lies and the propaganda that the culture that we live in is trying to cram down our throat and we must live not by lies. My friends, it is nothing new in 2021. It was nothing new in Russia in 1974. And it was nothing new 2,800 years ago in 1 Kings chapter 22. Because in that chapter of the Bible is the story of a man who made the decision that he would not live his life by lies. Let us pick up 1 Kings chapter 22 verse 1. For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year Jehoshaphat, notice this, king of Judah, went down to see the king 
of Israel. What is so critical for us as God's people is that when we understand the Bible in its context, it will open the Bible for us to understand. In 1 Kings chapter 22, we are introduced to two biblical figures. Number one, King Jehoshaphat, and number two, King Ahab. In 800 BC, God's people were a divided kingdom. Imagine for us as Americans if the South had won the Civil War. We would be a divided kingdom. You would have a northern kingdom. You would have a southern kingdom. That is the context of Israel's history in 800 B.C. When Solomon's son, Solomon, King Solomon died, and his son became king, Rehoboam, Israel split into two nations. You had a northern kingdom, which was made up of ten tribes, and that was called Israel. And at this time in history, their king was Ahab. Do any of you know who his wife was? Jezebel, that is correct. You must have been here at the first service, cheater. I'm teasing you. Not too many women running around with the name Jezebel, huh? For those of you who have daughters, did you get into the name bank and put Jezebel there as one of your options? Probably not. The king of the southern kingdom, which was made up of two tribes, Judah, that is where the capital city of Jerusalem is. And the king of the southern kingdom was Jehoshaphat. And the thing about Jehoshaphat is that he was actually a godly king. Now before we pick up in verse 3, I want you to notice something about this chapter. It never mentions King Ahab by name. It only refers to him as the king of Israel. And I will tell you why I think that is the case at the end of the sermon this morning. Let us pick up in verse 3. The king of Israel said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, see, no name, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. In 1 Kings chapter 22, King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat are having a feast together. And in the course of their party, King Ahab says to King Jehoshaphat, Hey, there is a city that is in the northern kingdom of Israel, Ramoth Gilead, that was taken from me by the Arameans, and I want it back. Will you go to war with me? So Jehoshaphat says, Yes, we are one people as God's people. I will join you in battle. Picking up in verse 5. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First seek counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? So King No Name has 400 prophets, and the reality about them is that they are all yes men. They are going to tell King Ahab exactly what he wants to hear. But King Jehoshaphat, being a godly man, sees right through the deception and says, Is there not a prophet of God that we can inquire of? Picking up in verse 8. The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. The king should not say that, Jehoshaphat replied. Can't you just see the whining and complaining on King No Name's face? Can't you just see the bottom lip hanging out? He never says anything good about me. Just as a piece of advice, you should be skeptical of people who always use the word always 
or never. Picking up in verse 9. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imlet, once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, had made iron horns and he declared, This is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, as one man, the other prophets are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. I want you to kind of picture the scene here. You have got two kings of Israel sitting on their thrones. You have got 400 prophets who are telling Ahab that he is going to go into battle and be victorious. You have got two armies that have gathered together to fight a war. And so the servant who goes to get Micaiah tries to give him a good piece of advice. Hey, Micaiah, just go along with it, okay? For your own good, please, just join in. Everybody else is prophesying victory in battle and that we will be victorious. So just go along with what everyone else is saying. Man. Can you imagine the peer pressure on Micaiah? Here is one guy who is surrounded by two kings, 400 prophets, and two armies. Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine the temptation? Can you imagine the peer pressure to just give in and go along with what everybody else is saying? Right? That was Micaiah then. But is it us now? Maybe some of your co-workers have found a way to fraud your company or fraud your customers or cook the books. And so they say to you, hey, keep it quiet. Just go along with it. No one will ever know. Think about all the money you will earn. Perhaps you're at work and you're called to one of those meetings and they are telling you about race and gender and sexuality and you know that it is wrong. And oh, the peer pressure to just compromise and go along with whatever it is that they are saying. I heard the story of a woman who was telling about her 10-year-old daughter, fourth grade, that when she signed into her Zoom class, the teacher asked her daughter, what is your preferred pronoun? I mean, good grief, people. This is a 10-year-old little girl. And you know the temptation. You know the temptation to just go along with it, to just humor it, to just be quiet and not say anything. But not this mom, because right in front of that computer, she told her daughter, honey, don't you dare give in to this. It is obvious that you are a beautiful little girl. Our culture and our world is telling us all of these lies and how easy and tempting it is for us to remain silent. Where have you had the opportunity to speak in the name of God's truth, but you remained silent? Where have you, in the name of tolerance, 
taken the path of least resistance and conformed to culture because of your own silence. Where does moral courage come from? Where does moral backbone come from? It comes from a heart. It comes from a mind that has been taken captive by the word of God. In verse 14, we pick up. But, there's one of those big buts. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. In his book, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chamber asked two questions. Number one, who are you trying to please? And number two, who are you afraid of offending? And Oswald Chambers says, if you are trying to please people, you will offend God. If you are trying to please God, you will offend people. Your ministry for Jesus Christ. Your ministry for Jesus Christ begins when your fear of God is greater than your fear of people. We are not called to live for the approval and applause of people. We are called to live our lives for the applause and approval of God. My friends, would you rather anger God or would you rather anger people? Would you rather disappoint God or would you rather offend people? Because here's the reality for each and every one of us. When we die and we go to heaven, we ain't standing before people. There is one person and one person only for whom we will give an account of our lives and his name is Jesus. Picking up in verse 15. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? You see, old king no name can see right through the sarcasm of the prophet Micaiah. In verse 17, then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. When the prophet Micaiah says in verse 17, that Israel will be scattered like sheep without a shepherd, he is prophesying and predicting that King No Name will be killed in battle. Verse 18, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? Y'all, there's the pouting lip again. He never says anything good about me. Can't you just see the whining and complaining? Verse 19, Micaiah continued, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. 
So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Canana, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, you will find out on the day you go to hide in your inner room. Y'all, verses 19 through, through 22 is one of the coolest places in the Bible because it's almost as if God pulls back the curtain and we get to see into heaven. And it is obvious from these verses of Scripture that the devil and demonic angels have access to the throne of God. And so one of these demonic spirits comes before the throne of God and tells God that he will be a lying mouth in the voice of these prophets. And what I want you to notice there is that God allows, God permits this demonic fallen spirit to go and to be a lying mouthpiece in the voice of these prophets. Do you all realize that there are fallen demonic spirits that exercise influence over nations and world leaders and cultures? Do you all realize that there is a spiritual battle that is being fought for the heart and soul of nations and cultures? Hello, American citizen. The Apostle Paul also pulls back the curtain for us in Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, listen to this, y'all. There is a demonic angel that was a prince over the kingdom of Persia. And that demonic prince had actually fought with the great angel Gabriel. In Matthew chapter 2, King Herod tries to kill the baby Jesus. Is it possible? Is it possible that he was incited to do that by a demonic fallen angel. In the War of the Rhine in 1794, the French took over an Austrian city without the use of any military force. So how in the world did they do it? There were 600 Austrian soldiers that were ready to defend this city. And their plan was that when the French attacked, they would blow the trumpet, rally the troops, and come to the walls to defend it. But what the Austrians didn't know was that the French had snuck trumpeter Joseph Work into the city under the cover of darkness and he hid behind enemy lines. At 10 o'clock, Joseph Work blew his trumpet to rally the Austrian troops. A few minutes later, Work blew his trumpet again telling the Austrian troops to retreat. When the Austrian soldiers heard that trumpet blast, they went to the walls of the city. When they heard the trumpet blast to retreat, they fled the city and left. And that's how the French walked right into the middle of that city and conquered it without the use of any military force. remember what Genesis 3 1 says now the tempter was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made y'all the devil is sneaky Satan is deceptive 
Satan is a liar. There is a traitor behind enemy lines. He parades himself as an ally. But my friend, he blows his deceptive trumpet. This is for you to decide. This is for you to decide. Is it possible... Is it possible that the devil and his fallen angels disguise themselves in the mouths of these people and activists who promote and push the LGBTQ agenda to destroy God's design for marriage and healthy sexuality? Is it possible? Is it possible that all of this stuff that is being crammed down our throats about gender and choosing your own gender is nothing but the mouthpiece of demonic spirits? Is it possible? Is it possible that the devil and his fallen angels disguise themselves in the news media with their lies and propaganda and twisted agendas. And I'm going to step on some toes here. Liberal and conservative. Look past the physical church. If it's not from the mouth of God, if it is not the truth of God's word, then where in the world is it coming from? We need to wake up and open up our eyes and see that we are not in a political fight for the heart and soul of our nation. We don't need more votes. We don't need our political party in power. What we need is for the church of Jesus Christ to go into our culture with Jesus' truth, with Jesus' righteousness, with Jesus' salvation. Verse 26. The king of Israel then ordered, Take Micaiah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, This is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return, listen to this word on the end, safely, right. Micaiah declared, if you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. Man, what did Micaiah get? For speaking the truth of God's word. He got slapped in the face and thrown into prison. Verse 29. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went in the battle. So old King No Name puts on a regular soldier's uniform and he goes into battle. My friends, he might have disguised himself from others, but he didn't disguise himself from God. Pick up in verse 31. Now the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, do not fight against anyone, small or great, except the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, surely this is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But when Jehoshaphat cried out, the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel and stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armor. The king told his chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long, the battle raged, and the king was propped up in his chariot, facing the Arameans. 
The blood from his wound ran onto the floor of the chariot, and that evening he died. As the sun was setting, a cry spread through the army, every man to his town, every one to his land. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried him there. They washed the chariot to pull in Samaria, where the prostitutes bathed. And the dogs licked up his blood as the word of the Lord had declared. Do do you think it was just by coincidence, random, that an arrow found its way through Ahab's armor? I don't. I believe that arrow was guided by the hand of God because it was God's will and purpose to fulfill his word. Here is why I think Ahab's name is never mentioned in 1 Kings 22. Because I think that when he comes to this place in his life, He is already as good as dead while he is alive. God's will is God's will. God's word is God's word. If God has ordained it, it is as good as done. If God has spoken it, it is truth. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther went to Wittenberg Castle and he posted his 95 thesis on the front door of that church. It was 95 things where Martin Luther was calling out the Roman Catholic Church, that they were doing that he knew was not the truth of God's word. So Martin Luther was called to what was called the Diet of Worms. And it was there where Martin Luther was told to recant his words. And this is what Martin Luther said. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot... And I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Do you know what our culture needs? Some Martin Luthers. People like you. People like me. People who are willing to stand on the truth of God's word. The truth of God's word is that it never fails. And we as the church of Jesus Christ, and we as his disciples, must stand and build our lives on the truth of God's word. So Ahab, after he is struck with this arrow, is propped up in his chariot. And all day he watches the battle rage. But while he is propped up in that chariot, Ahab bleeds out and dies. 800 years later, there was another king who was propped up and who bled out and died. Ahab died in disobedience. Jesus died in obedience to his father. Ahab died in disguise. Jesus was stripped naked and put on a cross for the whole world to see. Jesus bled out and died so that we could be saved. 
Jesus bled out and died so that we could be forgiven. There is no salvation. There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. My friends, if you have never been washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ, you are dead in your sin. If you have never been washed. If you have never believed in Jesus Christ, would you make today the day of your salvation? Would you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior? Would you repent of your sins and surrender your life to Him and receive His free gift of eternal life? Let us pray. God, as we bring our worship service to a conclusion this morning, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Jesus, I pray that by your shed blood, that by your death on the cross, that by your resurrection from the dead, that you would bring eternal life to anyone here today who is dead in their sins. And Jesus, I pray that by your shed blood, that by your death, that by your resurrection, that you would give us the moral and spiritual courage to stand firm on the truth of God's Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.